Good afternoon. I'd like to go ahead and get started. So my name is Kate, and I am the fourth co-chair to speak with you today. Um, I hope that you have had an engaging and energizing day. I know it's been tremendously exciting to see everything come together after so many months of work. Um, if you still have your postcard, please uh, record any last thoughts from this session and then make sure to hand them to the volunteers on your way out. We will mail those to you over the summer and we've heard from previous attendees that it has been a really helpful reminder to receive that sort of a few months down the line and be reminded of um, how valuable the conference was. So I'm very pleased to welcome us all back together for our last session of the day, uh, which is entitled Risk and Reward. So, oh my gosh, can you get them to close that door? Thank you. Okay. So Michael Smith of the White House will be delivering the keynote address, and this will be followed by a discussion moderated by Ted Snyder, Dean of the Yale School of Management, and William S. Beinecke, Professor of Economics and Management here at Yale. In his role as, as dean, he guides the school towards its mission to educate leaders for business and society. In advancing this mission, the school is guided by three aspirations, so people should know about that in advance of this. So this first is to be the business school most integrated with its home university. Second is to be the most distinctively global US business school. And finally, to be recognized as the best source of elevated leaders for sectors and epochs. So I know that as a student, I'm extremely excited that Dean Snyder was able to join us today. So please join me in welcoming Dean Snyder to the stage where he will receive the award. Kate. Thank you, Kate. It's a real pleasure for me to be here and uh, join your conference. Uh, it's also my pleasure and privilege to uh, introduce this last keynote of the day. Uh, Michael Smith is Special Assistant to President Barack Obama and Senior Director of Cabinet Affairs for the program, My Brother's Keeper. In this role, Michael manages the President's initiative to address persistent opportun opportunity gaps faced, faced by boys and young men of color and also uh, to ensure that all young people can reach and fulfill their potential. Uh, this initiative engages local communities, businesses, foundations, and others who work to connect young people to mentoring, support networks, and the skills they need to find, for example, a good job or to get to college. There's a lot of uh, uh, commonality in the work that Michael has done over his career. Previously, he served as director of Social Innovation Fund, SIF, a White House initiative and program of the Cooperation for National and Community Service. SIF combines federal and private investment to help scale solutions to complex social challenges. Three areas of particular focus for SIF are economic opportunity, healthy futures, and youth development. Uh, before joining the Obama administration, Michael served as Senior Vice President and of Social Innovation at the Case Foundation. Uh, in that role, he oversaw the foundation's giving and program strategy and guided numerous sector building initiatives and public-private partnerships. Earlier in his career, Michael helped to build national initiatives aimed at bridging the digital divide. He worked for the Bowman Foundation of America and Power Up. He also served as an aide to U.S. Congressman Richard E. Neal. Uh, so the plan is to have Michael offer remarks for uh, 10 or 15 minutes, and then uh, we'll return to have a uh, Q&A session. Uh, given Michael's extensive background in the space of working on these gaps, these divides, it's going to be a most interesting and informative session. Please join me in welcoming Michael Smith. Thank you, everybody. How's everybody doing? It's good to be back at Yale. I was here a couple years ago for uh, this conference with my boss, Gene Case. Uh, and this is, I, I just love this conference so much. It's an opportunity 
um, to really engage in conversation. So often you go to these sorts of conferences and you sit in and people talk at you and then you go home. But what I've noticed about this space is it's authentic, genuine conversations that really inspire. So I'm excited uh, to be here today and I'm looking forward to uh, having a conversation with you. So I'm actually today not gonna talk a whole lot about My Brother's Keeper. Um, we, we had a big conference at the White House yesterday where we brought together um, all of our communities. There are now 186 communities that have accepted the President's My Brother's Keeper Community Challenge. Uh, mayors, tribal leaders, county executives who have all stood up and said, uh, we have to do something about these disparities that boys and young men of color face, uh, and we're gonna do it with urgency. So I figured instead of me talking much more about My Brother's Keeper, I'd just show you a really quick video, and then we could talk a little bit more about risk and reward. myself in these young men. And the only difference is that I grew up in an environment that was a little bit more forgiving. And I told these young men my story then, and I repeat it now because I firmly believe that every child deserves the same chances that I have. That's why we're here today. I'm going to pen this presidential memorandum to determine what we can do right now to improve the odds for boys and young men of color. And we're committed to building on what works. So that's My Brother's Keeper, and I've decided when I can watch that video without tearing up, then it's time for me to leave the White House. Um, I was there that day, and so many people wanted to be there. Bill O'Reilly was there uh, when we launched My Brother's Keeper. Um, you name the congressperson, staff were showing up uh, out of the woodwork, flowing out of the East Room, uh, because there's excitement. Mayor Tony Harp here in New Haven has accepted the My Brother's Keeper Community Challenge. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> She was actually down at the White House for the U.S. Conference of Mayors and was able to get a pull aside with the president, uh, and he thanked her for the work that she's doing here. I think this past summer, uh, after a round of violence, she actually got in the street. She told her cabinet to come, law enforcement officers, and they were canvassing door to door, making sure boys and young men of color knew that they were loved and were co being connected to services. And so that's the kind of sweat equity that we're going to have to combine with results uh, to really make a difference uh, for these boys and for our country. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about risk and reward, and I'm going to talk about why it's time to invest in results. So first of all, I would say Americans nowadays are obsessed with data. We love it. If it's not liked plus one, rated or reviewed, we don't want to have anything to do with it. Uh, like we won't eat at a burger joint that doesn't have, I don't know, 500 uh, people that have liked it on, on Yelp. I won't stay at a hotel like, you know, before you go on vacation. I won't stay at a hotel unless it has about an 80% thumbs up on, on TripAdvisor. We, we love this data. Um, when it comes to dating, 
data, I, it, it's everywhere, right? So this uh, Amy Webb, who's down at the bottom of the screen, uh, she wrote this book about how she figured out how to game the system so that she could create the perfect profile to find her perfect mate. And it worked, and she's married and still married, and now they're making a book. It'll be like the new Sleepless in Seattle or whatever that movie was. And then you've got eHarmony that promises to connect you and your future spouse based on 29 dimensions of scientific compatibility. That's a whole lot farther from the bars where many of our parents met each other. <laughs> you know, and then let's, let's talk about the Mile Keepers and the Fitbit and the new Apple Watch that's coming out. Who has these things? We, it's, it's amazing. We literally can track every single step that we take throughout the day. Not only can we track them, we can then automagically upload them to Facebook so we can shame all of our fat and lazy friends <laughs> uh, to how healthy and fit we are. So we love it. We love data. We're, we're like in this modern data renaissance. But for some reason, when it comes to nonprofit organizations, we spend $300 billion a year on more than 1.2 million nonprofit organizations, many of whom don't even collect data. Um, one in eight nonprofits spend zero dollars on research and evaluation. More than 50% don't have a logic model or theory of change. And so we send our kids to community centers. We send our homeless and our hungry to shelters. We send dollars to try to find a cure for people that are struggling. And don't even get me started on the universities and the faith-based institutions that are sitting behind their walls in communities that are falling apart behind them, where they have no idea what's going on in the community around them. I know that's not Yale. Yale has been getting involved. Uh, in the community here in New Haven. <laughs> Some uh, PR needs to go talk to this woman over here. <laughs> and so Einstein said the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. But what about doing the same thing over and over again not knowing if there are results? not collecting results, not even asking the question. And why is this important? These are the stats that we all deal with every day. We've got 15% of Americans living in poverty. We're doing better, we're getting better. We still have 16 million children that are living in poverty. The kind of poverty in a day like this in New Haven where they go home and they don't know if they have a hot meal or if heat is gonna be on in their houses. We've got six million kids that we now, now call opportunity youth that are not in school and not working, just on the sidelines. In DC, our HIV AIDS rate is higher than seven PEPFAR nations. Gun violence deaths in this country, 35,000 a year. While violence tends to be going down, the Attorney General recently said, we actually have an epidemic on some of these mass shootings. And then there was an article in the Washington Post that came out that said, this is very recent, poor kids who do everything right don't do better than rich kids who do everything wrong. So more than ever in this country, our zip codes where we start is determining our future. We're putting our kids in our path. That's what we're dealing with. When it comes to the work that I deal with on My Brother's Keeper, we have a father problem. We don't have fathers in the homes um, of black and Latino boys. And even in the nation, the father at home problem is getting worse and worse. We have a problem when it comes to reading at grade level. We have a problem when it comes to black boys in prison. And then black boys, who make up only 6% of the population are more than 50% of the nation's murder victims. Yet, we keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. How do we measure success, philanthropists? How do we measure success, those of us that are giving? The first thing we do, this is my favorite, and I've probably been a victim of this before, you've got one kid, maybe you've got two, a boy and a girl, uh, someone of, of different races, and they've had some tremendous success after they've gone through your program. And you put them on the cover of your fundraiser and the checks keep pouring in. No data to back it up, other than these isolated stories of success. Another way that we make decisions in philanthropy and in the nonprofit sector is because our friends told us to. You know, it's kind of like Girl Scout cookie time. Donate to this one, trust me, it's great. It's doing really good work. But the worst sin that we do in the nonprofit sector and philanthropy is we get caught up in the numbers. Not how many lives were impacted, but how many numbers were served. How many kids' coats we handed out. How many bowls of soup we served. 
not how many people's lives are changed. Why is this a problem <laughs> in this country? Well, it's really simple. It's a, it's a case of simple math. Need is at an all-time high, and revenue that is coming into the social sector is flat at best since the, re uh, the Great Recession, and down in many ways. So we have to pause and say, what are we going to do about it? So I think there are four things we could do. Uh, so the first thing you could do is you could try to tax the wealthy more. We've tried that. We could, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> we could try to magically do more with less, like my friend Mickey. Or in one of the greatest nations on the face of the earth, we could say more will do without. What I think we need to do is we have to bet on the winners. We can no longer say that it is okay to just continue to write checks to organizations that have no evidence of impact, investing where there's no opportunity. And so that's exactly what we're doing across the federal government right now. And some of you heard a panel earlier with uh, Keisha Kirstie, who used to be on my team at the Social Innovation Fund, uh, and Lance from New Profit Institute. But what President Obama did when he came into this office, he said, we are going to have to invest in what works. We are spending way too much money across the government without any evidence of impact. So Social Innovation Fund was created in 2009 to help actually channel more money to nonprofit organizations that had meaningful evidence of impact. It was an idea of investing in innovation instead of the stale and status quo. It was the idea of investing in evidence instead of isolated stories of success and the idea of investing in scale instead of a one-hit wonder. And so what does that look like? It looks like some of the organizations that you saw here today, College Advising Corps that is actually using volunteering service to really help make up for the guidance counselor challenge we have, Gear Up that is getting young people that are at risk, actually getting them training and skills and moving them into jobs. It's, it's, it's so funny, some of this isn't, isn't rocket science, but how many resume writing courses will we fund instead of making sure that our kids have the skills they need and finding pathways to jobs that the communities need to be field, filled? It looks like Corporation for Supportive Housing, which has great programs throughout the state of Connecticut, that's getting the chronically homeless and those that are also chronically ill out of the emergency rooms into homes and into treatment. And it's programs like Redis that are creating businesses that they're then employing the hard to employ. So that's what it looks like for the Social Innovation Fund. This is why it matters to me. Uh, does that kid look familiar? <laughs> so uh, I grew up not far from here, so my mother is here today. Uh, <laughs> she, <laughs> she hates this picture. <laughs> What, what, this one's a little better because it doesn't show the gigantic glasses that uh, would, would normally be on back in, at that time. Anyway, so I, you know, I grew up not far from here in, in Springfield, Massachusetts. Um, and my mom was 16 years old when I was born. Uh, so was my dad. We grew up in a poor black neighborhood. Um, uh, you know, the typical things that you find in, in poor neighborhoods, drugs, crime, violence. And if you look at all the statistics, you would say, Kid like that shouldn't be standing here today giving a talk at the Yale Philanthropy Conference. And so I found myself asking why. Uh, why, why am I here? Why am I one of the, the kids that made it? And so there are lots of things in my life. I, I had a mother who was smarter than the average bear at 16. Uh, I, I'd give my 16-year-old mother uh, to my average 35-year-old friend now, uh, who just, she just had something. Uh, there, was, there was church. Uh, I was a Pentecostal pew baby, so I was in church all the time. Uh, we could talk about that all the time. Uh, so that, that probably had something to do with it. My mother put me in a school busing program, which probably helped. Uh, but when I think about why I'm standing on the stage today, why I do the work that I do, it's probably because I went to a boys and girls club. My mother dropped me off to a boys and girls club because she was looking for free childcare. Uh, and what she got was a host of second parents. Um, I had my second mom, I had my second dad, I had cousins, aunts, and uncles, I had this village that surrounded me, that protected me. I had my first jobs and opportunities. And it really transformed my life and I can mark it back uh, on the road that I've been able to take here today. But as I've reflected on that, and I've spent 10 plus years in philanthropy, I'm saying, well, there are hundreds of things that looks like, thousands of these things that look like boys and girls clubs all over the country. Why isn't there a line of kids here? Why do I see so many of my friends who seem to have fallen off and didn't make it to this moment? And, and, and what's even crazy, it's not because there's a shortage. 
In my neighborhood, I would say within a five mile radius, there were five more organizations that looked exactly like the one I went to. We had a Y, we had a Dunbar, we had a Martin Luther King Center, all different boards, all different nonprofit organizations, all different fundraising campaigns, none of them working together, but all with really, really, really good intentions. But despite all of that good intentions, how many of you know Springfield, Massachusetts? Okay. <laughs> We're working on Springfield, but these are the stats. 12th most dangerous city in the country, idyllic New England town, beautiful, Pioneer Valley, third highest teen pregnancy rate in the state, 11% unemployment, and 154 murders in the past 10 years, city of 120,000 people. And you know what those murder victims look like? They look like me. Most of them are boys and young men, most of them are black and Latino, and most of them come from neighborhoods like I came from. They look like kids like my brother, Tori. My brother and I had different moms, same dad. Literally grew up down the street from each other. Tori, at a very young age, got caught up in drugs and crime and violence. And no matter how we tried, we could never save Tori from that system. And at 27 years old, in the same housing development that he grew up in, Tori found himself shot and killed in daylight in Springfield, Massachusetts. That's our family struggle. Tori left, oh, <coughs> excuse me. Tori left behind three amazing kids. I was just with them last weekend. My niece and two nephews. He left behind a family that was devastated. Uh, and most importantly, he was a good kid. You know, you look at the, the news. <coughs> you look at the news and you see these kids and you just keep going because it seems like somebody else's kid. But he had a great heart. He just couldn't escape it. Tori was probably the last of about 10 of his friends that didn't see their 30th birthday. Many of them didn't see their 25th. You could count, I saw them. You could pick their names off and yet you go by in the news. So that's what my family deals with, but that story is told all too often in cities across this country. Go to the city over and over and over again. There are families like mine, there are stories like Tori. And I asked myself, how do we face statistics like that, yet we still put on our black tie and we go to that gala and we pat ourselves on the back for doing good enough? Meanwhile, kids, our most vulnerable community members, are falling through the cracks. And so I ask myself, why haven't we paused? Where's the outrage? Where is the urgency? Where is the demand for innovation and results in the idea that we will start doing things differently? So for me, the moral of this story when it comes to results is if you won't eat at a burger joint that hasn't been picked, prodded, rated, and reviewed, then why would you invest in organizations that are our safety nets, that are our springboards for our future, for our most vulnerable, for our assets. That's what we have to think about in this country. That's what's on the line. So you're probably asking me, all right, Michael, what can I do about this? Well, I wanna leave you with three things. One, we're gonna have to be fearless. For some reason in this country, nonprofit organizations and philanthropy, especially philanthropy, you're supposed to be able to take risks. If you can't take risk in philanthropy, you don't have the same shareholders. You don't, you don't have the, the same risk that your nonprofits that, you, that are dealing with people on the day to day. Why aren't we taking these risks? And so I was at the Case Foundation, we developed this approach called Be Fearless, encouraging more invest in innovation uh, and more risk taking. And there were five principles that we found are really at the heart of successful social change makers. One, they make big bets. They call people to action. They don't say come this weekend, they say come for a year. They say Kaboom, do you guys know the organization Kaboom? They say we're gonna have a playground that's in walking distance of every child within America. They say like malaria no more, we're gonna eradicate malaria deaths by 2016. They don't go for the incremental or the safe, they call people to action like John F. Kennedy did. 
They experiment early and often trying new things. They believe that failure matters and you don't sweep it under the rug. We love to do that in philanthropy. We get that report that we don't like, you never see the light of day again. But we know that we can build on top of failure and make something even better. They reach beyond the bubble, not just looking at people that look like them, but bringing in the corporate, bringing in the government, bringing in the, the, the mayors and the youth all together to get results. And they let urgency conquer fear. So we're gonna have to start being fearless in the sector. The second thing we're gonna have to start doing, and that's not just for philanthropy, that's for all of us that write these checks at the end of the year to organizations. Don't donate another dollar. Don't donate another dollar to an organization unless you know not how many kids are they serving, how many went to college, stayed in college, how many got jobs, kept jobs, how many went through the program and lives are being transformed, not just being served and not getting any results. It's gonna be a hard thing to do, but that's gonna, what's gonna get us from good enough to great. The third thing to do, and actually this might be the hardest for us, is to know when to walk away. And in and, and the, and the private sector, there are all sorts of market forces that tell us when to walk away. When Clear Pepsi was released and no one drank anymore, <laughs> we, knew when to, we, we knew when to walk away. When Frankenberry was no longer making the sales, we, we knew when to walk away. When the neon and the leg warm, maybe they'll come back, but we knew when to walk away. <laughs> but for some reason, we don't know when to walk away from granddaddy's nonprofit when kids aren't even coming to the door anymore. And so we're gonna have to encourage mergers, we're gonna have to encourage acquisitions, and you know what, sometimes we're gonna have to say, no, we're not just gonna write you another $10,000 check, you're actually not doing good work, and it's time for us to walk away. And there are gonna be people that are gonna say this is too hard. There are gonna be people say that we don't have enough time. There are gonna be people that say, these are people's lives that we're dealing with. And I would say, absolutely. That's exactly what we're dealing with. There are kids that are standing and falling through the gaps. And we in philanthropy, we're supposed to be in that breach. And we're gonna have to be serious about our mission. And it's because of these words that Dr. King said not too long ago, that there is such a thing as being too late, that tomorrow is today, and that we have to have a fierce urgency of now that activates and animates our passions, our intentions, and everything that we do because our kids, our communities, and our country can't wait. Thank you. Thank you. Let's sit down. So Michael, thank you. Thank you uh, for sharing the story uh, about Tori. Uh, especially given you saw everybody recently. Thank you for um, dissing Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> you, you may not know, one of our most famous graduates happens to be CEO of Pepsi. I but love she Indra. Would, she would agree with you. <laughs> she would. Because <laughs> market forces do in fact matter. Um, and, and, uh, and also sort of raising the bar of energy and challenge. And um, I think it was just a r really fired a lot of people up. Um, I have two things I'd like to ask you about and then we'll open it up to questions. For people who have questions, uh, Kate, you said write things down. Yeah. And we'll go to uh, 420. I think we got started a few minutes late. Uh, so I'll try to be brief. But to take your uh, point about measuring impact and investing in evaluation and bringing it local. We had Kirsten Levinson, executive director of New Haven Leads here uh, within the last week or so. And I can tell you basically, we've got a big problem at the third grade level, according to Kirsten. So 70% of kids in the New Haven Public Schools at third grade are two grades behind in reading. Okay. So I, I think they're doing a great job with the 500 kids they see every week, but your, your push was pretty tough on evaluation. So 
if, if you were a friend of New Haven Reads or on the board or uh, you know, a donor, what would you be pushing them to do? How much, you know, maybe share of resources raised, if they have a half a million dollar budget, how much money should they be spending on evaluation? So I, I w it, it really depends, right? So I wouldn't say exactly. Uh, within the Social Innovation Fund, uh, the organizations that we fund get grants a minimum of a million dollars and uh, a maximum of 10 million, and they then triple that with private sector investment. And on average, our grantees are spending about 20 to 30% on evaluation because they're trying to prove, improve, and, and scale interventions that work. And so you, you really have to 20 see- 20 to 30. 20 to 30%. So that's probably shocking, and I suspect very few organizations reach that. But am I correct? So, sorry to interrupt, but I mean- No, no, I no, think yeah. if, if you think about the return between, you, you talked about the five safe haven places. Mm -hmm. If the, if the return on their efforts varies from not very good to superlative, you'll find that out. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I think what happens, so in the case of the Social Innovation Fund, the government's picking up most of that tab uh, for research and evaluation, and that's a really good use of government dollars. And so one of the things that people uh, think about when they talk about this discussion of evidence is, well, does that have to be us? These organizations are getting the randomized control trial, they're getting the randomized control trials, they're getting the highest levels of evidence. But what we challenge organizations to really think about is, it just starts with data collection. It starts with having the data, reviewing the data that doesn't cost a whole lot of money, pre and post, ta pre and post test, watching it. I was with the uh, CEO of the new CEO of Harlem Children's Zone yesterday, and they actually make decisions on a weekly basis about programs that are working or not how to move money, which children to go where, uh, when it's time to take someone who was going through intervention A and move them into intervention B. But there, there's a spectrum, uh, starting with collecting data, then going all the way up to the highest, most rigorous levels of evidence. Sounds, it sounds right to me because even if the government's not paying for it, I mean, your point is, in some ways, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue of reputation the organizations that can establish a reputation for success, even though it's a costly use of funds, I mean, it takes money to do this or it takes effort, probably the cost is going down because data stuff, is that, that exercise is going down in terms of cost. But if you can establish your reliability, your, your ability to repeat good results, you're gonna attract more resources. Absolutely. And you can also, you don't have to build it. Uh, you can buy it um, or you can replicate it. So we challenge folks to think about being evidence informed. You know, when you're first starting, are you basing this on a principle that you know to have worked somewhere else or are you doing it because in your heart you think this is the right thing to do? Um, can you bring in, there's a, there's a great uh, organization called Greenlight Fund uh, that takes and finds effective programs and helps to bring them into places that don't have those strategies. Well, I think this probably resonates for a lot of the uh, people within the SOM community you know, at, at the business school here because it's a, it's a way for us to help and, and many others. The other question I wanted to ask about is the, the point about organizations should go out of business. And um, can you elaborate at all about that decision and the, are there nudges that need to be made other than I'm not gonna write the check anymore. Ph philanthropy has a huge role uh, to play in this. Uh, so one of my uh, grantees when I was at the Case Foundation was Mobilize.org. Uh, and Mobilize.org was encouraged by the Case Foundation and a couple other organizations uh, to merge with an organization, uh, I believe it was called Generation Engage. And so we did the work. Um, we brought the data together, we told them what a board could look like, we, we told them how it would work, what, it's the best of this program, what's the best of that program? And funders have an incredible amount of power to do that. Uh, the same was the case with Hands-On Network and Points of Light Institute. Uh, Gene Case was uh, on the executive committee of the board at that time, 
Uh, Hands-on network had volunteer centers all over the country. Points of Light had volunteer centers all over the country. Uh, they were doing the same volunteer service days. It was a hard conversation. Uh, who would stay in what leadership role? Who would do that? But at the end of the day, these two organizations merged, stopped having two separate galas, had one smaller budget, one office, and are doing more effective work today. And those conversations started with funders who can have that tough conversation and also bring the resources to bear when they follow through. So um, I don't know if you have questions. I can keep going. I've got lots of questions. <laughs> um, I thought I did. Okay. So one question is, how do you recommend conducting valid research when it's hard to get funding for it? That's <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, and, and, I, and I'll be honest, uh, philanthropy likes to talk a lot about research and evaluation, and I think we all know there, there isn't enough money uh, for, for research and evaluation. Um, the, the Obama administration has tried to make more money available. Social Innovation Fund actually was one of the few programs that had a budget increase uh, over the course of the last two years. We went from $42 million to $70 million. And so we're one of six here at Evidence Programs across the federal government, including the I3 program at Department of Education, Invest in Innovation. And so they have money there for folks that are doing this as well. Uh, and so I think, hopefully, I, I think we're at a place where the momentum is moving in the right direction. So philanthropy will start to make more of this available. But it also then goes back to the point that I was, was discussing earlier, especially when you're a smaller organization, there's a lot that you can do before you need to bring in um, you know, the bridge fan and the big re research firms, MBRC. Uh, there's a lot that you can do at pre or post test. There's a lot you could do taking advantage of pro bono support uh, from, I know a lot of organizations that actually did their first evaluation uh, thanks to a group of pro bono uh, volunteers from local universities. So students, that would be a good thing for you to, to, to think about. So you, you, you've got to try how to do it. You can start with the evidence informed, try the government, uh, really push philanthropy or start in places um, like this, where you can get some good volunteer support. So uh, a related question that I have is, man, I can't, this thing's hard to read. <laughs> I'll read over this. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> okay, so. We're live. <laughs> so, so, so if we think about innovation, you know, the, 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 the traditional, okay, you are at a business school. <laughs> the traditional uh, innovation model is one of portfolio. And so how big of a portfolio do you carry of projects mm -hmm. and push that envelope? How risky do you go? Do these questions resonate? Yeah. And do you have insights that follow from such a geeky question? No, no, it's, 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 it's an incredible question. Um, it, it's funny, Emmett Carson, who is the CEO of Silicon Valley Community Foundation, is a friend and a mentor. And when I first started talking to him about this be fearless con, concept, he said, brother, I can only be so fearless with my board. Uh, I've got, <laughs> there, there are limits of how fearless, how fearless I could be. And so it's actually interesting when you think about business. I think the stat is what, 20% uh, the average company spends on R&D? Is that, is that right? Someone know the answer to that question? I think it's about 20%. percent check. Um, well, <laughs> someone Google that. Uh, yeah. And so that, that is a model. I mean, don't throw everything out the window <laughs> all, all, all of a sudden. Think about having these targeted innovation and research and development areas. Um, there's Paula Kerger. And does that include pilot programs? Or Absolutely, yeah. pilot programs, try this, um, iterate quickly. Uh, Daryl Hammond at Kaboom says he tells his team to make mistakes as soon as possible so we can move on. Uh, and, and so Paula Kerger at PBS, she actually talks about how PBS has really stayed innovative, this big storied um, American institution that has one of the highest rated digital sites, I think the highest rated uh, digital site for kids, especially if you've seen some of their new remixes. If you want a good cry, go to PBS and watch the Mr. Rogers remix or the Bob Ross, the painter remix. It's really amazing. But she said the way that she did that was she took a team and created a little bit of a skunk works team of about a dozen people that didn't have to go to the daily staff meetings, didn't have to go to the planning retreat. Their job was just to make stuff try new things, throw pasta on the wall and see what sticks. And she mm -hmm. really charges that as being their innovation engine. 
Google does a similar thing where they give employees a certain percentage of time every month just to try new things. Uh, and, and then that helps they think their overall business. Th this question is perfect um, for you and, and I may have a follow up given some inquiries that we've done within the school. What is the role of government and philanthropy? Where does one end and the other begin? Well, I have a dozen lawyers who could answer that question <laughs> at the White House. Um, so, look, uh, when, it, when it comes to the work of the Obama administration, the president has really been pushing this idea of public-private partnerships, um, realizing that no one sector can do it alone anymore. Uh, you look at folks like the Gates Foundation, which people would think has more money than whoever, and they're in partnerships all over the world with government because they realize they can't do it alone. They also have the private sector uh, that's partnering with them. And so the government is really great at scale. It is not great at rapid testing and iterating of things. And so that's a, that's a great opportunity. So even the Social Innovation Fund, we're not the innovation like just trying something new. You've gotta be a little further along. And so philanthropy is really good at innovation, testing new things, trying out new things, and then the government can come along with bully toolkit for platform, for scale. And then the private sector is also really good on the innovation, but also continuity. Government comes and goes. Um, you know, just in DC, we had a mayoral transition and we were worried about our work with my brother's keeper. And it's really the private sector and philanthropy that kept that work going. So my postscript on this is that uh, we recently surveyed a group of students here at the school, and we asked them basically rows and columns questions. On the rows was, what are the big issues facing business and society? And then the columns was basically, where do the solutions lie? One of the, if not the top issue facing business and society was the nexus of issues around income inequality, mm. opportunity gap, things you're devoted to wor working on. The columns are very interesting to me. Where do the solutions lie? Could be entrepreneurship, the social sector, the private sector, government, et cetera. Where did this group of 61 Masters of Advanced Management students think the government or the, the, the solutions lie most, the government. Interesting. Yeah, really sort of a surprise to me. Hmm. Uh, I'll, I'll follow up and share those results with you. Um, that's, that's, I would say that's a shift from all research that, I, that I've seen. These and are not more from global a, students. Right, right. Uh, we, it caught my eye and, and uh, you know, we, we want to explore it a little bit. It's really interesting. But I think, I think a lot of these students are coming from sort of flat world perspective mm -hmm. and, they, and they see these problems maybe differently. Yeah. Um, okay, back to my brother's keeper. We're just having a little conversation here, don't mind <laughs> that. <laughs> how, does, how does my brother's keeper work with business to create career paths for young black men? So my brother's keeper is definitely an example uh, of the government working with the private sector and working in philan with philanthropy. So when the president launched it in the video that you saw, about 11 foundations um, announced a $200 million commitment to jumpstart uh, the efforts of My Brother's Keeper. And in the past year, there's probably been about another $100 million in private sector support. Um, you saw Magic Johnson on that video as well. I'm pointing here, there are screens here. You're probably like, what am I pointing at? There. Uh, the Magic Johnson co-chaired something called the National Convening Council uh, with Joe Echevarria, who is the recently retired CEO of Deloitte. And their job is figuring out what are the pathways for the private sector to play in this work. And it's, it looks very interesting. Uh, it looks like investments in Europe, uh, which was one of the organizations that, that we saw here. There's a, there's a policy apparatus behind My Brother's Keeper and there's an entering the workforce uh, policy piece. And so on the one side, you've got government that's working on that. And the Department of Labor this year announced a $100 million apprenticeship grant program uh, to, to really work on that. At the same time, you've got the private sector supporting things like Europe. And the interesting thing about Europe, uh, do, who knows Europe? So, well, these guys are so smart. Uh, so, companies pay $25,000 per Europe student because they believe that that's talent that can be well-trained and that can be useful in, in their workforce. They also see demographic shifts happening and being in communities where this workforce needs to be trained. 
And so there's a really interesting appetite because if you keep just throwing government dollars out on something where there's no path for sustainability, it, it's not gonna work. So having these partnerships where business is really tied in and very interested and can be a pathway to sustainability, that's where we see a, a nice intersection. A follow up on this, and this may be just, you know, Ted having his own sort of point of view on this stuff, but you said you grew up in, in Springfield, and I spent part of my gr growing up in, uh, in other parts of Massachusetts, and I remember kids getting jobs in the summer. Some of them, kids would go down the Cape, work for, you know, $4 an hour, and it just seems like that rung on the ladder isn't there even for white kids, yeah. let alone for black kids. Yeah. Um, and uh, am I right? Is there just not, not many summer jobs and this is sort of a, a fundamental problem? So it's about summer jobs, but it's about jobs in general. Um, you know, one of the things that we have to do is keep kids busy uh, and give them marketable skills that they can use. And so a lot of jobs to be there for some of these jobs are, are no longer there. Uh, the Workforce Innovation Act uh, that, that was just authorized, reauthorized, it provides dollars uh, to use that. Some cities are using TANF dollars in an interesting way for, for summer jobs. Um, but new, new data actually came out recently and showed there wasn't necessarily a, cor a, cor a <laughs> correlation uh, between uh, summer jobs and future employment, really? but there was a correlation between summer jobs and crime decreasing. <laughs> Huge correlations, I can't remember the, 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 the actual number on the top of my head, but you could map the period when the summer job program kicked off and watching crime in major urban areas going down. And so when we talk to mayors across the country, the US Conference on Mayors has a My Brother's Keeper task force, that's something that they are working on all the time and where we're trying to call the private sector to action as well. Next question, what is the role of the foundation or investor in empowering grantees to make use of their resources? Well, Pretty open-ended. <laughs> so I, I think it's, uh, how, how much over, is it an oversight question? So it's an, over, it's an oversight question. Or uh, micromanagerial if you yeah. want to take it to the extreme. <laughs> well, I mean, goodness, I, you know, I worked for Steve Case, um, who, <laughs> who uh, you know, was wonder kid. I think he was 35 years old when the AOL Time Warner merger happened, but he spent uh, the rest of his career as a venture capitalist and also trying to help usher the next generation of young entrepreneurs. And you know, we invest in, in companies like Zipcar and um, uh, Revolution Foods and, and some of these really interesting things. And, and I watch uh, all, all of the, the investment guys at Revolution and their peers, and they're in your business. And so you know, I, I'm sorry uh, if you think nonprofit that your investors shouldn't be in your business, but go to Silicon Valley. Uh, they wanna know what your color palette looks like because there's user testing that needed to happen behind that. Uh, they want to know what your, your burn rate is. They want to know where your CEO is spending his or her time. Uh, and so I would say if I'm making an investment, I am I'm invested in that investment. And what I think nonprofits often forget is you could call it micromanagerial, and you should have these relationships from the beginning, but you also have to think about what they also bring to bear. They could be your board members that are opening up doors, helping bring in new resources. They might have management practices uh, that can help overhaul how you're doing things. And so you, you want it when you're courting, you want to know what you're getting from your foundation and you should have those, those conversations up front. But I would, I would encourage people not to think about micromanagement, but about someone who's invested in your success. And I would say if we treated our nonprofit investments the same way that we treated our for-profit investments, there'd probably be more in your business. Um, but we let them go because they're just doing the nice charitable stuff. Yeah, I mean, I. Let, I'll tag on to the question because it's very relevant to you know what what we do. I mean, we bring in people who want to get involved in the school, and we want them to evaluate how we're doing. And uh, the, the 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 question that, that of when somebody gets 
to micromanagerial does come up sometimes. Absolutely. But I think what I'm hearing you say is nonprofits should probably err a little more on bringing people in and asking them to open up the hood, kick the tires, or yeah. you know, whatever the right analogy yeah. is. I mean, there are certainly decisions that are in the, the complete ownership of the executive. So if you have a board member that's telling you to fire your program manager, that's overstepping a line. Uh, you know, talking about your vacation, but there, there are these things, absolutely. Uh, but when it comes to the return on investment and someone wanting to advise and really being in your books uh, and, and looking at those things, I think that's healthy. Great. Well, listen, thank you very much. I'm going to um, offer some closing remarks, but uh, let's, let's uh, join me in thanking Michael Smith. Stay here or <laughs> so this is the tenth year of this conference, and I, I was talking with an alum who described uh, its early days over in Hill House in a very small classroom, and I uh, can't remember who put it together. A, Yale SOM faculty member, and uh, I, I should remember that, but I, for those of you who know me, I forget things. Uh, but it's, uh, it's come a long way, and we're just so delighted that uh, we're able to host it here in Evans um, and share, share the, this particular space. I've gotten great feedback on the kind of discussions that took place earlier today. I certainly found uh, the session today with, with uh, Michael Smith to close, uh, personally really inspiring and got me fired up and just thinking about things in a, in a more energetic but also um, analytical way. And uh, for that, I'm, I'm particularly grateful. Uh, for those of you who are part of uh, the, the Yale community, I just want to say, you know, we. We really appreciate your involvement. For those of you who've come from outside, a double thank you. Um, we're, we're really happy to have you here, have you connected to, uh, to uh, the school. And probably my biggest thanks, and uh, it's really a privilege for me, is to say thanks to our student leaders. Um, they're phenomenal. It's, it's, uh, in some ways, it's totally inappropriate for me to be up here because uh, I get to walk in and they do all the work. <laughs> but uh, it, it's great that uh, they have succeeded once again, raised our expectations and our hopes. Thank you very much. Katie, you've got some goodbye and closing to-dos. Kate. So before we close out, I just wanted to take a few more moments of your time. I wanted to once again, um, on behalf of the co-chairs and everyone who has been our sponsors, particularly our platinum sponsor, Newman Brain Foundation, and our gold sponsor, the Jared Katz Center. So please join me in thanking them. I also wanted to thank our advisory board, our student organizing committee, and also all of the staff here at Yale SOM who have helped make this day possible. So thank you. Um, a few logistical notes. We have been calling from taxis. Um, they are on a bit of a delay. People are not coming from Rockford much in the cold, I think. So um, if you're going to the train station or something, please do, uh, we encourage you to carpool. As I said, we have called from the dorm in St. Joe's so you don't want to come, but um, on your way out, uh, if you are unable to find you can ask for a taxi and they'll come out. The students will get back on the idea for us to come out. Um, and as I said, please order in advance. Uh, once I finish in about 45 seconds, we will have a reception on the fourth floor and I very much encourage all of you to join us. Um, so back up in the Miranda side of the building. Um, we will be posting a lot of the content from today. We'll be posting it online once it's 
that we can get into that. So if you would like to share that with colleagues in the organization or look at some of the sections that you weren't able to attend, we definitely encourage you to do that. Finally, we will be sending out a feedback survey tomorrow. So please do fill that out and help us to connect with the people who you might be talking to. So very last of all, I wanted to give my last thank you, which is for everyone in this room. So there, I'm so grateful to have you join us today and really turn this event from a conference into a community event. You are an inspiring group of individuals and it is our privilege to be convening a space like this where you all can come together and improve the quality of your work. We are very excited to seeing all of you next year at the Young Women's Conference. So um, on behalf of the four co-chairs,